Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, on my way past Christchurch St. Lawrence, I picked up three 10th century monks to help me out. <laughs> can I introduce them, please? Uh, uh, would you please uh, stand, thank you? Um, Brother Simon on the end, <laughs> Brother David, and Brother Keegan. I said to them, you won't get me in that gear today. <laughs> um, uh, what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is uh, the mysteries that surround a Gregorian chant. Um, the chant that we sing today is um, not the chant that actually would be have sung, would be have sung um, in the ninth or 10th centuries, mainly because many of the signs and letters and the interpretive values of the notes had disappeared for over a thousand years. And it wasn't until um, the work by a, a, a Salem monk, um, Eugene Cardin, Dom Eugene Cardin, um, was this, um, were these uh, letters and signs discovered. Uh, so, first of all, let me put up on the, the screen there a, a very famous chant called Puer Natus Est, which is the chant which is sung for the introit for um, Christmas Day. And all the notes are there on the staff. Um, and we've got the four lines. And we have also the here, the little cleft that tells us that's a C. We are able to sing that chant because the square dots tell us where the notes are. However, <clears throat> by about the time that we get to this four line uh, square notation, which is about the 12th century, um, uh, really developed uh, to the state that it is by uh, Guido of Arezzo, um, the nuances from the earlier manuscripts had gradually disappeared. The, the uh, standard of, of singing at the time was such uh, that the, the uh, scholars or the men scholars from the various monasteries would have memorized all the chants. And for the church's year, the chants uh, would have taken about 10 years to memorize. Many of the monks, of course, would have probably been illiterate. So um, they are, their, their memories must have been pretty well developed to have sung all the chants for the year from memory. Um, however, um, if we look at this, this, chart, this chart here, we find that, that if we look at it, that there are hardly any nuances there that tell us uh, to sing, how to sing the chant. So there's a couple, there's a, what we call an epicema over the top. So we would slow those down slightly and two dots at the end. And there's a couple of other things which, which um, uh, tell us there, that little short note that, that tells us to get on to a consonant a little earlier. I'm going to come back to that chant and show you later, and we're going to sing that chant for you. But um, this is what we know, basically, all of us in Gregorian chant. We may not know how to sing it, but it's not difficult to sing. Um, I know when I first approached Gregorian chant, I thought, oh, I've got four lines. I can't cope with it. So, uh, and I'm sure you felt like that yourself. So um, I want to show you this now. If we go back two centuries to the 10th century to 923, we have here a document which is the same chant that I've just showed you two centuries earlier. However, we've got the poor ear up here somewhere, it's, it's darkened out, and then we've got the poor natus est nobis. And above each of these letters, we have some very fine little squiggles. These squiggles are a proliferation of ideas of how to sing the chant. They even go as far as each single note telling us that, 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 they, that the next note must, must be a little slower or a little faster. This is done by the shape of the neumes as such, and also by the fact that often letters are added to this chant. So this is one chant here from, from um, St. Galen, uh, the, uh, it's, and it's two, two little chant areas, St. Galen and Einsiedeln, and they're about 30 kilometers apart. And the monastery at Einsiedeln and St. Galen still sing the chant today. Uh, 
So this is from that area of St. Gallen. The next one, we see down here, Pu ea natus est nobis, the same chant which we showed you from the very beginning. That shows a slightly different way of writing it. However, the, what is the phenomena? This chant comes from Laon in northwestern France, quite a way away from St. Gaul. And we find here that the chant nuances are telling us almost the same thing when to slow down, above the same syllables, when to get faster, when to get louder, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they're quite some far away. This chant uh, here is dated about 937. We go to the next one here, puer natus est. Here we have it again. And the lines and the, the nuances, all the chant um, notation, musical notation is written above the text. Uh, and this chant comes from Bamberg. Bamberg is over in, in Germany, just 100 kilometers uh, uh, west of, uh, east of um, Würzburg, or, or a couple of hundred kilometers from Bamberg. So we're, they're quite a long way away from each other. So the question has been asked by the scholars, um, why are the nuances somehow similar, that what is the phenomena? Was there an archetypal document that came out in the 9th or 10th century, which every chant expert had, and they worked from that? None has been found. Most of the scholars today, that know the, or the history scholars of chant, feel that probably um, that, that, that uh, scholar monks traveled from monastery to monastery, and that's more the likely thing to do. They still do that today. They have a wonderful time traveling around from scholar to scholar, <laughs> so these scholars. Okay, so we have uh, here the, the poor Natus Est again, and we're going to come to, back to that, and I'll get back to that a little, little later. By the time of the 12th, 13th century, um, uh, you can see all that's disappeared. Now, the question you're asking is, how do you know what the notes are? We'll get to that in a moment. The next one here is a lovely um, chant and a lovely manuscript. And we have that manuscript in our own library here in New South Wales, in the State Library. This is a part of what the Rimini manuscript is. And the Rimini manuscript, you can see the four lines here. You can see the clef that tells us that this, that's the C line. And we have here also. Um, uh, a very lovely picture, an historiated uh, picture of the chant. We have the Christus figure up here, looking down from heaven, and he's looking down on the deathbed of a Franciscan monk. How do we know it's Franciscan? They're all dressed in brown, except the, the, the celebrant and the, 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 the deacon. And they're um, reading prayers over the, the, the monk. Now, I think uh, I have a little theory. I think that monk is St. Francis himself. It would be a famous monk um, to have had um, a, a, a picture painted on that um, uh, in such a book because writing of music on vellum is very, very expensive. Um, so here we have uh, St. Francis. He died in 13, 20, uh, 1226, so it's not so long. This manuscript is dated 1328. What interests me is that there, apart from one little nuance there, a little, uh, little uh, 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 quescent effect that, that goes towards a, co a consonant, we'll show you later, there's nothing else on there that tells us how to sing the chant. Beautifully done, it tells us where the pitches are, but, but nothing more. Uh, so what actually happened? With the background of the, the chart, I'll, I'll give you some idea of how things worked. From the time of Benedict in the fourth century, we began to, to work with monasteries of monks who wanted to get away from um, everyday life and into a prayer life. And Benedict, as you know, set up the, the various rules, etc. And um, part of these rules were certain offices of the day that were, were um, uh, were to be sung, and the other important part was to sing the mass. 
we're not going to be concerned today with the offices, but we're going to be concerned with the mass. So by the time uh, that we get to the 8th century, the liturgy as we know it today has perhaps settled down. And by 812, that's when Charlemagne died, he had unified uh, the church or the Western church as we know it. And um, this then, under the aegis of, of, of Pope Stephen, um, was an, an imprimatur that went out to the various uh, churches and monasteries that this is the way that the, this is the, the, the liturgy, this is the way it will be done. And, uh, and then the, the music had to be written for, for it. Um, except to say that a lot of the chants would have already been in the repertoire because it was, a, it was a, an oral um, uh, phenomena, an oral tradition. Nothing was written down as we know at that time, but everything was remembered. It wasn't until the 10th century that we start getting the early notations, mainly because I would think that various uh, extra feasts would have been put into the calendar as saints died. And by that stage, there was a blowout and, uh, and uh, it would be very difficult to, to try and remember. Hence, we, we, we get these early manuscripts that tell us um, what happened. Then, as we start getting into Guido's four-line notation, we find, as I said, the nuances disappeared. And they disappeared for about a 1,000 years. And by the time we get to the 20th century, um, the monks of Salem have started the idea that they really want to go back to finding what was the early church, how was the chant sung. So they took photographs um, in the early 20th century and the late 19th century of all the chant books that they could find that had these early squiggles, um, or early neumes as we call, and took photographs of them. Then they began to make comparisons. And this is when they found the phenomena that the same chant as our poor Eonatus est, contains the same or similar nuances. It doesn't always agree. So, um, then a certain monk named um, uh, Don Mochero decided that he would really invent, without really any understanding or scholarship, uh, an idea of how the rhythm of the chant would go. There are no bar lines to keep four beats in a bar. Everything relies very much on the text and what the text does. You have to put your minds back, and I'd ask you to do this, put your prejudices in your pocket, put your mind back a thousand years, and imagine that you are now in an area, you are one of the monks or one of the sisters in a monastery and, and you're part of the scholar, and on the hour, you, the bell rings and you come up from the garden or um, if I were a monk, I'd like to be down in the cellar. You come up, down, <laughs> you come up from the cellar and, and you come into the chapel and you would sing the psalm of the day. The psalms are the backbone of the monastic order, the Jewish psalms. You'll find that, that, that all 150 of them are sung probably in, 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 a, in our modern day within one month. So they would all be memorized with their various chants. What we're going to talk about today is the, the mass, or the ordinary of the mass and the propers of the mass. So let me show you, first of all, the map of Europe. Here we have St. Gaul and Einsiedeln, and they have a tradition of a certain writing of how to write the, ch the, the chant nuances. Bamberg is up here. We have Long here. These are full, practically full manuscripts that have survived. They weren't like a hymn book where there would be lots of them that you'd find um, over, over a thousand years. One, only one probably existed in every monastery or two maybe, and that was the property of the, of the cantor who would, rem the nuances would re remind him what he ne needed to, to purvey to his scholar. The scholar didn't have the books um, the cantor would have. So you can see how valuable they are. They found one in Laon, one in St. Gaul, and one in Bamberg. I've been lucky enough to have the one in Bamberg 
put down in front of me for half a day and uh, with a stick, and I was able to turn the pages with the, with the stick. You would, by looking at it, you would have thought that the monk had only written it yesterday. Quite amazing. Uh, so these are various families. Other areas uh, like, for a little part, Non and Tola, uh, Benevento, they have very important chant books as well, but just slightly later, a year or so, a uh, uh, hundred years or so later. By that stage, all the nuances were disappearing. Now, here we have the ordinary of the proper, or the mass of, uh, of, the, of the day, and we see here the, the ordinary has the Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctus, Benedictus, the Arnius Day. This was all set by the time uh, just after Charlemagne, and, and we use that still today. This is, then the propers um, are, the, are the, the things that change by Sunday, depending on what day it is, the feast day, etc., etc. And the, the, the introit is the, is the, the one, the, the chant that, that sings down the uh, clergy party by, with the president and all the, the servers, followed by the choir, etc., etc. They all come down the aisle to the high altar, and that's the introit. The gradual is sung after the first lesson, and in, the, in Lent, we sing what we call a tract. Then the Alleluia verse comes, the Alleluia always heralds the gospel in, and that is sung, then the offertory um, in the second part of the Mass, and then the communion. Those propers are what we're concerned. The neumes don't exist so much um, on the Kyrie or the ordinary, because they would have been sung Sunday by Sunday. They're not necessary that would be in the memory. But because these changed only once a year on the specific day, we had, do we have um, the nuances really written down in such fine detail. Here we get to the, the Ozana. Now, um, this Ozana here, you'll see, um, has the square notation, which we've just been talking about. There's our little C. And underneath it, it has the music or the neumes from St. Gallen. What I'm going to do is, before we get onto that and sing it for you, you're actually going to sing it for me. So let, let us look a little bit out at how these neumes work. If I write on the board, and I hope you can all see that, could you sing that note for me? Just to ma, please. <laughs> ma, ma. All right, okay. All right. Can you sing this note for me? And... <laughs> wow. You did exactly what I wanted you to do. You've just sung some 10th century manuscript. <laughs> okay. What have you sung? You've sung a tractalus. Virga. Okay, now I want to string those two together. How do I do that? I do this. And I, rather than having a, a ma, I'll give you a pitch now. Ma, here we go. Ma, the next note, ma. Instead of having two distinct notes, I'm going to put them together. Ma, and ma. All right, now, if we go back to our manuscript here, we'll find that we've got a little nuance here, like that one there. All it has, it's got nothing on it at all. Nothing tells us of how to sing that, whether that's smooth or if it's going to be a little more definite. Let's look at that again. I can change that in the early neumes by doing this. That becomes, this is what's called a pears, looks like a foot, a pears rotundus, because it's round, so it's nice and smooth. Ma, ma, look at my hand. Ma, but the next one is ma and ma. So, by the conductor's hand or the cantor's hand, he could indicate to his monks what he actually wants. And those hand movements began to be the basis of what was put down as the early chant. And this is what's called chironomy. 
the, the art of conducting. Uh, there, we've not discovered anything that's proved that's it, that exactly where it came from. But as we go along, it stands to reason that the hand movements do play a lot uh, in this. So, and I can do this the other way around. I can go, ma, or I can go, ma, and by ma, and then I can change this, ma, or I can do this. I can put a C in front of it. A C means celerity, you don't need to know, it just means to go faster. So I can go ma and ma, or I can put a, an epicema on it, which means to slow it down. Ma, or I can put a T on it, which means tenete. Ma, which is, means a stronger sound, and ma. Now, I can put these, all these together, like this, this first one and the second one, and I've got one of my favorites, torculus. And my hand shaped like so, ma, and ma, or I want to stretch it a little bit. Ma, let's sing that, ma, you're doing very well, you belong to a scholar soon, okay. <laughs> or I might like to do this. <laughs> Already you can see what we have lost. Uh, I just want to use that as a demonstration. What we have actually lost in terms of the nuances. And that's what we will demonstrate with you today with the scholar um, uh, to, to give you an idea. So first of all, um, let's have a little look at the Hosanna. Can you give me a, an appropriate note? Okay. Hosanna, filio David. Before we had those nuances, we would have sung the Hosanna. Hosanna, filio David. Would have sounded very nice in the acoustics, but it's, it's, what is it? The day, it's Palm Sunday. What's happening on Palm Sunday? The leaves are being thrown down, the flowers in front of the Lord on, on his donkey. And that would have been a, an important day for the monks. Remember, we're all monks and sisters in the monastery, so we're getting excited about all this. <laughs> so Palm Sunday is coming. So the first day, Oz, uh, note again. Ozana. Look at that big gap of the first one. That's the trumpet call in, the, in Gregorian chant, the fifth. It's telling us that this is an important moment. Ozana. But when we look at the nuances here, underneath, here we've got our, our pairs here on this one, but it's been truncated to look like this. The answer is why, what's happening here? Why is that so? Because they want us to get on to the next consonant quickly. They're shortening the second note. So rather than going, Ozana, they want us to go, Ozana, because also of the double N, can anybody tell me a, another good reason of why you would need to articulate the, the consonants? One word, acoustic. acoustic, thank you. The acoustic of where the chant would have been sung in, 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 in some of the monasteries would, would um, necessarily um, need to... Uh, be articulate to, to, for the words to be heard. The, the monks aren't necessarily singing to anybody else out in the congregation. They probably weren't there. What they're singing to are to themselves, and what they're singing is so important to them on that particular day. So, let's look at that. Hosanna, filio David. Hosanna to the son of David. We've got our lovely torculus here, a nice smooth one, but you can see that the notator, the, the 10th century notator, has employed this one because the, the Hosanna, the filio David, is very important because the, the filio, the son of David, the son comes from the, the family of David. Very, very important. So, he, and also it's a, a cadence at the end of the line. Hosanna, filio David. And also, son of David, 
there's the Trinity, the three-note figure, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And we often see that at cadential points or anything to do also with the Son. And then the next line along here, nothing at all, just nice light chants. Benedictus, nice and flowing. Then we get to here. Qui who comes in the name of the Lord. The name is very important. What they've got here, they've put an epicema above this little clevis here for us to slow it down, to emphasize the, the word. Qui venit in nomine domini. Now, as I'll sing this through, there is a medieval mistake here. I wonder if you can find it. Osanna, filio David, benedictus, qui venit in nomine domini. It doesn't agree with the old chant of 200 years beforehand. Can you tell me what, what, what the word is? Domini. Domini. Oh, you've got good eyes. Yes. Domini. There should be Domini. The note being dropped. Now, in transition from going from the early manuscripts to the later manuscripts, we've dropped a note, a medieval mistake. Now, I have a theory about that. The theory is that, that, uh, that Brother David here, who is on the scriptorium, he's writing away, uh, he's copying one script from another. We didn't have machines we could press a button and do a copy, all done by hand on, on vellum, very expensive. And we have Brother uh, Keegan here, and Brother Keegan, is, is, uh, just, he's just approached far, uh, Brother David to say that the, the abbot has asked us to go downstairs, the new wine has arrived. <laughs> so we all go downstairs, and then an hour later, or two hours later, Brother David comes back, gets back onto his scriptorium pen, picks up the pen and misses a note. That's my theory, anyway. Okay, can I get you to sing the first phrase, please? Let's, we'll get a note that suits there. Osanna, filio David. Let's try it again. And Osanna, filio David. Now, I don't want you to look at that anymore. Now, I want you to sing that again for me. Oza and Oza filio Good, I'm holding auditions just after the... the, the <laughs> very good. Already, with one run through, you have remembered half that chant, which is really quite phenomenal. Already. Now... Let us sing this chant to you, um, and we'll try and put on the nuances, and uh, so I'll get the brothers to stand if they would like to, and we can... What are we doing there? Can we do the... No, this is, is, is written. We're not going to put in the, in the nuances. We'll do what the square notation tells us at this stage. Osanna filio David, benedictus qui venit in nomine domini.
as you can see, the chant has come alive. It, it's not just sung through. Every single nuance or word is taken into account. And even within one, one syllable, for instance, on the Ra there, Israel is very important. And the E-L at the end, the Israel L, meaning God, is, is emphasized and pulled back. Um, and, and, and it's placed on a cadence point. The King of Israel, Hosanna in the highest. So it's, it's all the nuances are really getting us into the mood of what the day is about. Okay. So here is another one from the uh, Psalm 22, which is a very important. It's known as the, the, the Psalm of Christ on the cross. Psalms are written a, a, a quite some time, of course, before the the death of Christ on the cross. But, but these are the words that, that Christ mentions, oh my God, I cry to you, why have you forsaken me? Um, and it, they're, they're emulated in the psalm. So this is known as the, the, as the, as the crucifix um, uh, um, psalm. Deus meus, and this is a real cry uh, in agony, the cry to the Lord, why have you forsaken me? Remember, we're monks, and, and this day is very important to us, we're, and monks and sisters, we're back in our monastery again, and we, we've got to Good Friday or Maundy Thursday, and how important this is. We're, we are experiencing this as we, uh, as we go through the Triduum in Holy Week. So here we have the Deus, and above it is a very strong tenete, which not only means to hold back, but means also to emphasize uh, uh, and to actually sing out loud what we see on the text. So, Deus, Meus, and we've got the Tenete beside two Episemas. Um, the, the, uh, this is part of, uh, just to mention, part of my study that I've been doing on, uh, on these new 